many sights to see And when I look in my window So many different people to be That it's strange So strange You got to pick up every stick up every stitch You got to pick up every stitch mm-hmm. Must be the season of the witch Must be the season of the witch Yeah Must be the season of the witch Where hinges creak in doorless chambers And strange and frightening sounds echo through the halls. Wherever candlelights flicker, though the air is deathly still, that is the time where ghosts are present, practicing their terror with ghoulish delight. Welcome, foolish mortals, to... The Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark Review Podcast! (laughs) Oh, boy. Oh, man. (laughs) Well, Sandy, I didn't love this. I don't think it's quite as good as something like Goosebumps. But I thought it was okay. I, you know, I... I thought there were a few decent chills and thrills in there. I did really like the practical effects throughout. Mm -hmm. That being said, there were some weak spots. Specifically, uh, I really didn't give a crap about the characters at all. The characters felt like they felt like Stranger Things on Ritalin. And that's kind of putting it nicely. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know, Sandy, this is kind of a mixed bag because I respect visually what this film is doing. And honestly, even on a, uh, you know, in terms of framing the horror sequences, yeah, it resorts to jump scares a lot to be sure. Mm -hmm. But I think this film does have some rather effective jump scares. All right. So I went into this movie very, I went and saw with my sister and uh, we were both really, really excited to see this because, you know, I'd been hearing about this this project, this scary story to tell in the dark um, type project for a very long time now. At first, thing, I think it was some kind of uh, it was some kind of miniseries, I think, and now then it turned into a movie. Uh, so, you know, I was really excited to see it. It it didn't meet my expectations at all. Uh, like you said, I, I really enjoyed the practical effects, but I was pretty upset coming out of the theater because it, man, without giving away any spoilers, the story in this movie is just, it's its just, it's so, so weak. It's just, it's just, it's just so, so weak. I mean, okay. that's, the only, that's the only thing I can say. It's just so, so weak. <laughs> Sandy, I'm going to raise you something here, all right? This is kind of what I was thinking watching this movie, okay? If we could get, like, the same level of genuine suspense and cool creature designs found in this movie mixed in with, like, the cool conceits and actual good characters and writing found in Goosebumps, then we'd have something. We would have something, yeah, because I, I would see the exact thing, the exact same thing coming out of the theater. It's frustrating, Sandy. It's frustrating that both these books from our childhood that we love so dearly, like they have movies where both of both Goosebumps and Scary Stories do have good things about them when it comes to being movies. Yeah, cause, but uh, man, I, I mean, their strengths would kind of complement each other. You know, coming into the theater watching uh, after seeing Goosebumps, I was pretty hard on it. I didn't like it very much. I was I was way too hard on that movie because <laughs> that, that Goosebumps compared to this is is just it deserves a standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is the, the practical effects in this movie. The costumes look terrific. 
and the fact that their actual practical effects people in costumes is is just it makes it that much better um there's a really great video uh that was posted online i think it was looper right oh uh, i think it was the uh the hollywood insider or something like uh, that okay Hollywood Insider. It was Hollywood Insider, and uh, it's basically this this in depth look at uh, the making of these practical costumes, and they look great. Like uh, the the toeless woman, um, we saw her face I think twice on screen, maybe three times, but no less than like five seconds in total the entire movie. And the mask, the prosthetics, they look terrific. It looks just like the book, but we mm-hmm. barely get to see it in the movie. It's like the the costumes and the monsters and the creatures in this film, they can't make up for the bad the bad writing because the writing in this is just, it's just. I can't look past it. It's, it's really just terrible. Bad. It's, it's really, really bad. It, so it starts with the three main friends and just the dialogue right off the bat. It's just I I don't believe these people are friends. <laughs> I don't believe it at all. Um, th- what they're saying doesn't feel natural. Uh, it feels forced. It feels like the the writers are trying to uh, trying to trying to be funny, trying to be you know quirky or just kind of goofy, and it it doesn't come off well. I didn't laugh once during this movie, and <laughs> and there were several moments where the writers were very obviously trying to throw a laugh in there, uh, and throw a joke in there that would should be deserving of some kind of chuckle at least um and i I just sandy that's why that's exactly why i described this movie as stranger things on ritalin (laughs) um you know i the two the two main stars in the movie uh i i wasn't buying their performances i i didn't I totally wasn't buying their chemistry. I'll say that much. The, the before, yeah, the chemistry was 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 not wasn't selling. The performances were selling better than the chemistry, um, but still, I I just I wasn't. I a honestly fan of... think the main girl did a good job with her acting. Like that's oh, she, about... did, she, did, she did a good job. Honestly, but... like that's about the best I can say for any of the acting in this movie outside of like the monsters is she did a good job with what little she had to work with like there are some moments especially when it relates back to her abandonment issues where you do really Uh, feel for her and you know uh, this goosebumps did a similar thing uh, where it has this this side thread story where this, the main character, specifically the main character and their their parent, their single parent, have this uh, have this kind of sad history with their other parent, who is either dead or missing or whatever, uh, and they don't focus on it enough for us to care, or for me specifically, specifically for me to, to care. I, I didn't care about the parents or this this main character's side story considering her parents i didn't care at all they were trying to put way too much focus on that towards uh towards the end and i just wasn't buying it because it wasn't set up properly and it just didn't work i mean that's just one example of why the writing in this movie just falls flat okay um, I, I i will agree that the writing on the uh on the dad isn't particularly great but sandy that man is dean norris all right He's Hank from Breaking Bad. He is a national treasure. And my God, he is doing everything he can with what little that role has to offer him. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not ratting on the actor or anything. It's just that the writing is just is what really bums me out because it just brings the entire movie down. If the movie had a better story, had better dialogue, I think it'd be a lot, lot better. Just mm-hmm. loads better. Because what they do with this is, is you know from the trailers, uh, this Sarah Bellows character that they invent for the movie specifically wasn't in the stories as far as, far as I remember. Um, maybe you can correct me. No, as far as I know, it was, it was kind of like a plot device invented for the movie as far as yeah. I know. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, and 
you know, a wise man once said that horror is a very straightforward thing. When you take something like this, something that mm. people are familiar with, uh, it's, it's much like Goosebumps. You take something that people are familiar with. Um, Goosebumps did this right because they didn't add in any any um, any characters that people are like, you know, like characters like Sarah Bellows, where we don't see her uh her her character her history but it's it's very it's very vague um you could argue that hannah in goosebumps was was that character and it, that argument would be invalid because hannah was from the books so yeah i mean in comparison to goosebumps sandy i think really uh the characters are what sell goosebumps and that's really what it comes down to uh you know I mean, with this, it's like we do get some emotional performance out of our lead, but you're right, it is a very stock, like, oh, my mommy left me, and I feel sad about it, and it's my fault, even though it's obviously not my fault. Uh, I mean, that being said, man, we did get that one scene with Dean Norris, where Dean Norris is on the phone, like, you know, like, pleading with her, like, it's not your fault, come back, it's not your fault, I need you to know that. And, I, I, like, Sandy, in a better movie, that would have been a really good scene. Because there would have been stuff actually building up to that point. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm just going to share a couple little things here. They're not spoilers. Okay. I mean, they're not spoilers for the story, which is, in and of itself, spoiled completely. <laughs> but um, the main character, oh, what's her name? I don't, I don't Scarlet. know. Scarlet. Was Scarlet. it? Scarlet. Was it? I, I see. It. See, I, 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 I saw like, the movie. I am about ninety percent sure that it was Scarlet, and I saw it about a half hour ago. So. Yes, I see. I saw this movie earlier this evening. I can't even remember the name of the characters. <laughs> um, there was Scarlet. There was Augie. There was Chuck. And I honestly can't remember the name of Scarlet's boyfriend character. Yeah, yeah. I, I really can't remember that guy's name at all. Anyways, um, <laughs> anyways. So this, the main character, we'll just call her Scarlet for now. Um. She is into mon old monster movies. It's real at the very beginning, which I was really digging because, you know, that's something that you and I both have in common. It's something that you don't usually see too often. I mean, I I've never seen a female character, a young female character, uh, so interested in monster movies the way this character supposedly is. I mean, she has po these posters all over her room. She's read all these great uh, old horror comics. Uh, it's really, it's really, really cool. Um and I thought, oh, wow, I think I'm going to like this character. It's a good foundation for a character, and they don't really go anywhere with it. Exactly. They go nowhere with it. And she, she's, she's... Especially because immediately, like, as soon as she gets in the same car with the, uh, you know, the hot guy of the movie, Sandy, basically her entire plot is like, A, solve the mystery, B, get with hot guy. <sighs> yep. Yeah, and, and the monster movie nerd stuff kind of goes out the window. It goes completely. It's never referenced again. Mm -hmm. What they, they they make one they they talk about it very very briefly when they first meet, but after that, it's just nope goes out the window. And I feel that kind of the story her her passion for writing stories kind of goes out the window too because she never uses that to her advantage until I guess the very end where she kind of does. I think but, if anything, the writing the stories thing was used as a plot device to be like, oh, you're an author, so you're making these crazy things happen. Exactly. Um, and that was just really weak. Yeah. Really weak um, attention. To... Yeah, it was. And it, the Sarah Bellas character, I think, is, is I'll just go back to, to her, a very, very weak character because it's basically... Basically, her character in this movie is is she's kind of been erased from history because her family uh, kind of disowned her um, for 
for reasons I still don't understand because they never made it clear in the movie. It's the Sarah, the Sarah stuff is just too complicated. I mean, it's, it's like it's running, it's running on Pirates of the Caribbean sequel logic, Sandy. You do never want to be running on Pirates of the Caribbean sequel logic. Exactly, they make it way too <laughs> complex. The scary stories tell in the dark stories from the books, the original books. Those stories were never you know complex it was you know they were very very simple bits of folklore they were and they were scary too he had the great mm -hmm. illustrations to go along with him like me tie doty walker basically it's just a haunted house head falls down the chimney dog you know keels over dies after speaking english that's <laughs> that's pretty much it um and the Sarah Bell's character just stayed it, it, the whole the whole writing of this movie in general just it does not operate on that same type of, of simplified but still scary logic you know it's just it overcomplicates things and I think her character the Sarah Bell's character in general is just they they it's it's excuse it's an excuse to make her as vague as humanly possible uh, say oh she's this mysterious person who no one knows about. It's just an excuse for us to not write as much or to, to, to skimp out on character building or whatever, you know? Can I make yeah, sense? pretty much, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, it, it, oh, man. The music, I, I loved the music, uh, the opening music to the movie. I, I mean, what do you think of the fact that they use the same song for the credits, though? I, I, yeah, I know. I, I, no, I'm not talking about the song. I'm talking about the actual score. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The score, I thought, was uh, sounded uh, kind of Danny Elfman-esque, and I was really digging that. Uh, same with Goosebumps. I think that both the, 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 opening, uh, the opening score in the beginning uh, specifically was, was pretty well done, both these movies. But, um, yeah, it's, it's – that's, I guess, the only <laughs> – one of the only positives, of course, the monsters – in this are are a huge positive. Do um, you want to talk about that for a little bit, or anything else you want to cover as far as? I mean, uh, I, there's one thing I want to bring up. Yeah, go ahead. In terms of story structure, which is kind of where I was hoping this movie was going to go before the book and everything got introduced, was I was hoping this movie would essentially be kind of one of those movies where where we follow a large group of characters throughout one night and a scary story is happening to each one of them. So for example, when the bully character is fucking with the scarecrow, I thought that his scary story was of course, naturally going to be the scarecrow. And uh, you see where I'm getting out there. Like, I think they could have simplified it a lot where they didn't necessarily need to have an explanation for the scary stories. If they would have just had a movie about scary shit happening to a bunch of kids on Halloween and spread it out like you spread out the characters in a disaster movie or something, I think that would have worked wonders for this. Yeah, that's another thing. They introduced this Halloween concept, and that just kind of just gets cut <laughs> off after the first ten minutes. It's this like, is they, not a Halloween movie. It makes yeah, you no. think it's a Halloween movie, but it's not a Halloween movie. <laughs> exactly. They, they, they go into this creepy old house, uh, and find this book on Halloween, and that's all that happens on Halloween. Mm -hmm. I guess the bull. I guess. I guess. I guess the scarecrow comes alive on Halloween. That's 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 it. it nothing else happens on Halloween. That's that's it. And <laughs> that just that's again. That's one of the many things in this movie with the story uh, that just kind of just falls flat, goes nowhere. Um. Yeah. I, feel like I mean, it makes it kind of a that. chore to get through. I mean, this movie's only, what, like an hour and 40 minutes? But yeah. I got to admit, I was kind of struggling to to hold my interest. Yeah, I was too, especially towards especially, the end. Especially in that, yeah, towards the end, I was going to say, like, okay, folks, first of all, I want to just kind of say, uh, uh, let's let's kind of cut this off here in terms of the non-spoiler stuff, Sandy. Uh, let's give some final thoughts for the folks. Uh in terms of non-spoiler final thoughts, folks, go see it if you're into practical monster effects. I mean, I honestly think it's worth a ticket just to see that stuff in motion, especially if you're a fan of the books and you know the illustrations in the books. Mm -hmm. Because visually speaking, I mean, I like that's one thing that we cannot begrudge this movie at all. I mean, visually, the monsters in this are creepy as shit. 
they're accurate as all hell to what's in the books. And I think, generally speaking, the performers in those suits do a really, really good job. Yeah. So that is like, that is the one thing about this movie that you cannot, you, you really can't see say anything bad about the creatures and the monsters in this thing. And if that's the only thing you care about, if that's what you're here to see, and you don't really care about the plot, by all means, buy a ticket. Like, buy a full price ticket. By all means, you're going to enjoy yourself. Yeah, I I, I agree. I agree. If, if, especially since you know, I, I just I just came out of watching twice. Once upon a time in Hollywood, which has oh, terrific man. writing. Oh my gosh, terrific writing! <laughs> <laughs> Ironically so, enough, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood also doesn't have very much of a plot structure to it, but that movie does it very intentionally. So let's get into some spoiler stuff with yeah. scary stories. Spoilers! 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 Um, okay, so a couple things here. Obviously, the film has a very generic kind of slasher movie vibe to it, with the characters getting killed off one by one. And um, so, some, some, something to know is that, uh, obviously, this is PG-13, so the deaths are, are relatively off-screen. I think the bully probably had the, the most graphic of all the deaths, right? I mean, what I like is I like the fact that the deaths are very suggestive. Yeah, I like that, too. You know, I... Yeah, you know... You're right. You're right. They are pretty suggestive when I think about it, because... Uh, do you want to explain how these guys die, or, or should I? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Well, I guess, quote-unquote, die. I mean, I think the, the bully's pretty obviously dead. It, 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 they kind of leave it open-ended at the very end, which I, I didn't like, because I think they're going to make a second one. I thought, why would they make a second movie? Oh, no, wait, there were two more books so obviously they're going to make another movie um well they might who knows if this doesn't do well then I mean, that's the thing sandy like just I, I mean we're kind of jumping jumping through here but I, just to address it yeah that sequel bait was pretty damn cringy it was it was oh especially... don't worry augie and chuck are coming back in the next movie because Fucking you cared about it because you cared about them so much in this one, we we're gonna bring them back. It was, it's like, it's like, I mean, Ezra, Ezra, how can you how, how can you not care about the uh, the fan favorite? The uh, I mean, forget about Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth. Oh, <laughs> Ezra, guys. I mean, the the fan favorite relationship, like bromance of the year, is clearly Augie and Chuck. Oh, definitely. I mean, get an ovation for those guys. Give them an Oscar. <laughs> I didn't care about any of them. So the sister is the only one of the four that uh, four or five. I don't know. She's kind of the sheriff. That the sister is just kind of like hanging out in the back with the lovebirds at the end. Yeah, that. Like, hey, I'm here too. I'm going to be in the sequel too. And the thing is that that. Her face is the last one we see in the movie. It's like she was like the the main, like the, the most important character all along. It's like, no, what are you doing? You know, the sheriff said that she was in the nut house. That's all I needed to know. Okay, she's she's still alive. That's all I need to know. I don't care about her. I just, I, I, oh. uh, but all right. But can we talk about some some of the uh, scenes that are particularly effective, though. Do you want to talk about the deaths? And not, not specifically the deaths. I just want to talk about the sequences themselves. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. I want to talk about the uh, uh, the pale woman. The pa yeah, that was my favorite. That was the best scene in the movie by far. It was just, it was psychologically fucking terrifying. It was. I mean, I like. Oh my god! And that's what I'm talking about when it comes to suggestive. I mean, that scene was suggestive as all hell. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, and uh, yeah, boy, that that was a good scene. That was a good scene. The 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 setup was really nice. It, it was kind of like because this character, uh, they go into this, they go into this um, room. This where they keep all with this psychological hospital keeps all of their re old records. Uh, and it's called the Red Room, and this is a room this character does not want to go in because he had a dream that uh, basically he goes in there and he sees this pale woman, just like in the book, like the, the female character in the book. Uh -huh. uh, and he, he avoids going in this Red Room. He runs off, and he ends up in basically 
what he was trying to avoid the entire time the red room the red the red hallway basically it's like it's inevitable he, he can't escape it. I mean, this is like it's a nightmare scenario because it's like there's millions of branching paths and hallways, but each of them there's the pale lady just waiting for him and getting closer and closer. Exactly, and she she's not she's not she's not moving fast at all. She's just walking uh-huh. very very slowly. I and honestly think the fact that she's walking slowly makes it all the more freaky. Yeah, because it's like you know, no matter how slow she walks, she's still gonna reach you, and you yeah. can't escape her. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, so good, so and good. The, the the fact that she she walks up, uh, she walks up, just, just walks right up to him, and just puts her arms around him. He just like morphs into her body. That's mm. just that was disturbing. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, Sandy. Like to me, that is more disturbing than anything they could have done with any level of gore. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I completely agree. <laughs> One character. So, oh yeah, go ahead. Okay, no, what, what one character? What I was gonna say, the one monster I wanted to see more of was the the toeless corpse, because that uh, the design for that character uh, was based off a very very popular design in the book, and we barely uh-huh. got to see it. Uh, uh, I think you know which one I'm talking about. They 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 stole from the design of the 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 murdered woman in that haunted house. Uh, yeah, the that, that whole toe scene felt a little rushed. I mean, the it did. I think the only the only cool thing about that scene was the whole like the mysterious stew that shows up in the fridge, and I like the fact that he's on the phone with his mom, and the mom doesn't know how the stew got there, and he's like, yeah, it's "Well, like it's stew, isn't it?" <laughs> it's like, "Well, someone made it. I'm just going to eat this random stew in the fridge." <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, I'm not. I'm not saying that's like a positive. I'm saying that kind of made me laugh. But other than that, yeah, that I, I would say that scene. I hate to say it because you're right; it is such a good character design. But it probably is the weakest scene in the movie. It really is. Especially, I mean, or, like I mean I, it's the weakest scene, at least in terms of the uh, the monsters and kills. Yeah, yeah. Because what basically happens is uh, he eats the stew. He pulls the, the he literally pulls the toe out of his mouth. He's terrified. Which I he's will up- admit, that is a pretty gross-out moment. I mean, that is yeah. pretty effective. <laughs> yeah, it, it, that was pretty effective, but it doesn't save the scene. So basically what happens is he's on the walkie-talkie with, these fr- with his friends, and the book is literally writing like uh, like um, someone, like a ghost is writing in, in the book, the story of what's happening, what's going to happen. Uh-huh. Uh, they're, they're, they're trying to warn him, and... Uh, He's basically not listening to him because, you know, all generic horror characters don't listen to what's <laughs> right. What's being warned right in front of them. Wait, uh, wait, wait. Are you calling Augie a generic horror character? It's Augie, Ezra! Well... I, I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> obviously. I wanted to say something. I, I had something. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, so he pulls it out of his mouth. Uh, he he hears the voice. Who who has my toe or whatever it is? He runs uh, to the bedroom. He closes the door. And he just basically we, we cut to the the, the toeless corpse. This wonderful design. This, this adaptation pulled straight from the book. It looks terrific. Uh, and I I I, cause I saw the, the shot is in the trailer. You can see it on the trailer. Of this woman, this corpse woman, and I thought, oh, I can't wait for the close up. I cannot wait for this close up. But we never get a close up. No, uh, not ever. No. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's so like the opposite of the pale woman because the pale woman, we see plenty of her. Oh yeah, uh, plenty of close ups. Yeah. So what happens? He goes in the room. He goes under the bed, and we see the door open. Uh, and then he basically he slowly crawls out under the bed. He looks over the the side. Then he's like, oh, I guess I escaped her. And then he's pulled underneath the bed. We get this we get this very, very, very quick, like, <laughs> half, half a second. Uh, uh, I guess, you, I guess you, it's technically a close-up, but you can't even see the full makeup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's very rushed. You can't appreciate it. And then he gets pulled under the bed. They find they pull the bed out later, and you think, oh, so there's something, there's something, it's going to be really freaky what we're going to see. But no, it's just the nail marks in the floor that basically just morph into the wall, basically just disappear into the wall. Ooh, and that's scary. what I said. Ooh, scary! Yeah, it's just, it's 
it's it's nothing. It's it's absolutely nothing. It's like ah, eh, that was terrible. <laughs> All right. Well, most of it got spoiled in the trailer, but regardless, what did you think of the pimple scene? So the pimple scene. I mean, you know, I, I thought. Uh, um. I've always thought of like, what if that happened? How would someone react to that? Could that actually happen? And obviously, I that... I think it could technically happen. I think it could technically happen, but um, the chances of it happening are about one percent to a hundred. Uh, I'm just saying, if you have an open wound on your face and a spider crawls in there, well, I. I don't want to talk about it. I don't think it's very possible. I'm just saying, man. You don't want to talk about it because it's feasible. <laughs> well, the thing is, I, I don't think that... Ah, we should talk about it. It's going to get too... Uh, too uh, Fair too enough. Graphic. Fair enough. Um, so I, I think they did maybe go a little too over the top at the end, but I do like the body horror of it. Ezra, I'm a man who appreciates his body horror, and I think this was a great body horror set piece. Especially with, uh, even before the, I, honestly, I think when the spiders came into play, it kind of peaked, you know what I mean? It was kind of like, okay, guys, this is, this is a little crazy here. But up until that point, the whole, the pimple growing bigger and bigger, and then something yeah. moving inside the pimple, like, that that was all just, ooh, really, really, really bone chilling. It was, I, I agree. And her reaction afterwards, she's just, like, traumatized, she's just shaking, uh, I thought that was, uh, yeah, that's how someone would react if that actually happened. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I don't necessarily think they'd go to the nut house, but that's how they would react without a doubt. Um, let's just uh, let's just talk about the uh, the last, uh, the final climax, and then kind of call it a day, all right? Okay. Okay, so I, I think the problem with the final climax is that there's just way too much going on. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And if I, I'm going to say one little thing here is when you, you have a movie like this, a horror movie, where basically the characters are trying to escape the inevitable, you want to set it up in a way where it's like, okay, these characters are not going to get out of this, but you know they're, they're going to get out of this. And you want to – it's it's that classic twist. You want to add a, a really juicy twist in there, and this movie oh. does not add a twist in there at all. It's, it's very, very predictable. You know what's going to happen – it's it's again the writing <laughs> the writing so i mean i think i think the stuff with uh the stuff with scarlet is problematic because like we said it's just it's, it's running on pirates of the caribbean sequel logic it just it really like it, it just kind of falls apart at the seams how complicated it is with the book and the you know and the the different timeline thing and the family thinking that she's Sarah and it, it, the whole thing's just a mess. It just completely oh, a, falls apart. Yeah, you're right. It, you're absolutely. Her name is Stella, by the way. But um, oh, really, I was yeah, totally I, I, wrong. Then I was totally wrong about the Scarlet thing. That yeah, shows I, I, how much I know Ezra. Yeah, I, I just got out of the movie. <laughs> well, I, I had to look it up myself. But yeah, you're right. You're right. There, there's way too much happening. It's all very, very vague. Uh, like you don't understand. How, <laughs> you know, uh, I I like I like uh, what we got with the the jangly man. Um, okay, you see the jangly man. I kind of had a problem with just because it goes on too long, and at a certain point, it kind of becomes more of an action chase scene than it does a horror scene. You know, I I, I appreciate it for the fact that you know that's that's a guy in a suit for most of the time you yeah, know for sure and for the, sure the, the fact that they go the go the lengths they do also they we just get more more screen time with the monster I, I like that um of course i shouldn't be resorting to these things because the story should be carrying it not the monster <laughs> but <laughs> i digress um yeah I, I there came a point where it came more uh more comedic i think than actually scary uh for me, at least, um, mm -hmm. I like that they had they they because the, the jangly man is basically uh, an extension of the uh, Mitai Doty Walker head that falls from the chimney in the very first book. Um, so it's it's kind of, I think that's kind of an original character. I'm not sure. Maybe it's kind of a combination of the head and something else. Um, 
But the dog, the dog I was really looking forward to because I thought, oh my gosh, the dog's going to talk. The dog doesn't talk. He just kind of barks and it kind of sounds like the words and that's not very fun. <laughs> yeah, it's weak sauce. They can't even get a talking dog right. <laughs> I mean, come on, guys. Come on. I mean, get your act together. And cats and dogs can do a talking dog better than this movie can. Oh, ooh, that's, ooh, that's really sad when you put it's, it that it's, way. It's a low blow, I know, but it's... <laughs> Oh God! And the, the, even if it was cheesy, I think that'd be fine because the head, the head falls down. And it's just the CG animated head. Me tired, honey. Why you that? That was just ah. Oh, I just I, I just slumped back in my seat and put my my hands over my face when I saw that. I was like ah. Oh. You want you want to make it seem realistic with a dog, like a dog could actually do that. But then you pull like that that CG animated head with a goofy expression on its face, and it's like ah. Oh. You're just you're contradicting yourself, movie. <laughs> Make up your frickin' mind. Yeah. All right. <sighs> well, suffice to say, I think we can both agree this movie definitely did have a few standout scenes in it, especially the pale woman, who I think is kind of worth the price of admission unto itself. Should we? Uh, should we? That, should we talk ahead. about for very briefly of uh, how basically Sarah Bell is and how that all kind of wraps up at the end? Dude, dude I honestly don't fucking care. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go very briefly for the audience. I, mean, I, I was at that point. I was just kind of like checked out, honestly. I was too, but I'll just go over it very briefly. What happens is basically uh, Stella, this character, is basically she she meets up with Sarah Bellows ghost and tells her that she's going to tell her story that Sarah Bellows was innocent over this family drama that was going on. I I don't understand, but. She's basically going to fix I everything. Really and... don't, I really don't get how, like, you know, now the story's out there, so the scary story's going, it, it, it completely falls apart. It, that, yeah, that, exactly. It falls apart. You think the friends are going to come back now that uh, Sarah Bells is kind of at peace with, with the I kids? I totally but, thought that, too. Yeah. But, no, they just, she's like, Sarah Bells is kind of like, oh, just screw you. I'm not giving those kids back, by the way. You know what also bothers me about that is that uh, Stella seems, like, relatively fine to trade this, like, sexy draft dodger guy who she's known for, like, two days uh, over her lifelong friends. I know, right? And it's like, this, you know this guy... I mean? it, 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 it seems to be just, like, a perfectly reasonable trade for her. <laughs> Right and like the fact that they pull this this whole army, you know, he's he's not he's just not going to fight for his country. They just pull that out of nowhere. It's like whoa, no, it doesn't work. Um, and that kind of ties back into the fact that this movie takes place in 1968, and which was something else that ties into Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which takes place in 1969. Movie is is the that, weak sauce version of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, isn't it? It is because it, I, I never bought for one second that it was actually 1968. No. Whereas in Once no. Upon a Time, I bought the entire thing. You cannot convince me that it was not 1969. And it's like it, it's it's it, you know they have the cars in this movie. They have the cars. They have the costumes and whatever. But it's I don't buy it. I just don't buy it. Um. Anyways, let's let's wrap this up. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, I like I said, I do think that some stuff is worth the price of admission, especially if you are a horror fan. And suffice to say, I think one of the cool things about this movie is that it really is genuinely suspenseful for a younger crowd. Like, I was yeah. genuine. I, I had some genuine suspense in this movie. Like, you know, especially with some certain sequences. So, I, know, I, 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 I went in... I, I went in trying my best not to get uh, not to get freaked out or creeped out or anything, and you know that's if I if I'm gonna go see a scary movie, I'm gonna go in trying my hardest not to get freaked out. And then once it actually does get a little too freaky, then I was like, oh wow, you know this actually did scare me. It's not just just jump jump scare cheap jump scare kind of stuff. But I, I there there is definitely some pretty freaky imagery in this movie. Oh. Um, but if 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 you're uh, uh, someone who grew up with this in the '80s or '90s, and you're, you know, you're an adult like one of us is now, then uh, it's it's not going to get too scary. <laughs> and this is PG-13. Um, I do respect it for what it is. I respect it for being genuinely 
a, a PG-13, like, teen horror movie that's not in the goof, Goosebumps mold of, like, hey, we need a wacky Jack Black character to sell the movie, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. As much as I love Jack Black and Goosebumps, don't get me wrong, I love that character, and I feel like a character like that is kind of what this movie's missing in some respects, but... I don't know, it's all relative, it all kind of balances out. If Goosebumps could just have uh, more scares, and if this could just have more characters and better plot, then I think we could all just have better movies in general, but that's not the role we live in. <laughs> all right. There's one thing, one little thing I want to share here. Um, for anyone who's who's listening, there are two new items coming out based around these, these Scary Stories books. Um, there is a, a fan-made book featuring a whole bunch of new stories uh, made by two guys uh, and brand new illustrations that look just like Stephen Gamble's original artwork. That's coming out uh, very, very soon. I think probably next year they're doing a Kickstarter later in the fall. But you can go on. It's it's called The Scary Stories, A Tribute to Terror. Look it up on nice. Google. You'll, you'll see a whole bunch of great images, uh, artwork, and concept art. Um, there's also The Scary Stories documentary, uh, which... I'm going to buy on DVD because it's, it, I didn't realize it was already out. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where you can purchase it. I know there are a few um, I reviewed it on Amazon myself, and it's Did very you? Okay. good. Yeah, okay. it's very good, Ezra. It's a little I, on the short side, but it's very good. Well, I'm going to go buy the DVD just so I can have an actual copy of it. But sure. I, even though I haven't seen any uh, either of those, I um, haven't read the, the book, haven't seen the documentary, I can guarantee that there are hundred times better than this movie. <laughs> so, to our audience right. members, go go check out those two properties because uh, I'm sure they're very much worth it. Okay. Thank you guys for watching. We will be uh, probably doing more spoiler casts like this in the future. Of course, August is going to be a relatively slow month when it comes to movies. I mean, Ezra, to tell you the truth, I think this is it. Like, I think we kind of peaked in terms of the movies that I was at least excited about in the month of August. Well, Tiki, what about Dora? Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus <laughs> we, Christ. We, that's right. We, we still... are going to do Dora. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, you that's know, right, folks. I, I'm going to really be kicking myself in the butt spending 10 bucks on a movie ticket to see that. I don't give a shit about how much I spend, all right? The fact of the matter is, I am going to be the creepy older man sitting alone in a movie theater <laughs> watching Dora the Explorer, all right? <laughs> that is not something that I am okay with, but god damn it, I run a podcast based on 90s animation nostalgia, and so it's gonna get done. <laughs> Could have killed you! That was a terrible throw.